So um, on on Melbourne Planetarium, my job title I'm the digital production designer. Uh, basically, I get to put Planetarium shows together. So that means I work as an animator, editor, compositor, general all round. At anything that's kind of visual that goes on the screen, I'm involved in. Um, so just quickly before we go, I just want to know who's been to the Melbourne Planetarium, or been to a planetarium. Oh, okay. And who's been to one in the last five years? Yeah, yeah even less. Okay, good. Um, so I thought I'd give you a brief history of planetariums. So the first modern planetariums are probably older than you think. They actually started in the 1920s. Um, so the first one was actually built on the rooftop of the Carl Zeiss factory, which is in Jena in Germany. So Carl Zeiss are the manufacturers of lenses, have been doing that for like 150 years. And it was the first idea was to, like, how can we recreate the night sky and do that during the daytime and, you know, how, what sort of technology can we need to do that? So they, they built this dome, so that, that could make a hemisphere of stars, if you like, and they started with a star projector. So this is the very first star projector they ever had. Um, basically, this part would produce all the stars. It was motorised, so they could actually rotate the stars to the sense of the night sky moving during the night. Um, and this whole section was all little individual projectors for the moons, or for the moon and for all the planets, because they move at different speeds relative to the stars. Uh, limitation of that particular one was to only show you the stars as you were on that latitude exactly. So if you're in Norway or Italy, the stars would look different. You couldn't do the southern hemisphere at all. <coughs> The first public planetarium opened in 1925 in the Deutsches Museum in uh, Munich, largest science museum in the world. Absolutely amazing. So if you ever get a chance to go to Munich, go to the science museum, it's quite incredible. So they had the first one open to the public in 1925. This one here is the Jena Planetarium that opened a year later, and it's still in operation. And it's beautiful. You go inside, it's got an Art Deco sort of restaurant in there. Um, and they feature very prominently still in the Full Dome community. They actually run a festival every year. Full Dome Films have been doing that now for 10 years. So very well recognised. <coughs> so star projectors. Main technology that's been used for 70 years, pretty much, is a star projector. And they've kind of developed slowly. They, they did develop. Uh, the Mark II came out in about the 1930s. It could do the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. So one end would be for the Northern Hemisphere, the other end would be for the Southern Hemisphere. So they could do stars as they would appear anywhere on the, on the planet, I guess. Um, even up into the 1990s, they make the ones that now look like this. Very funky if you go to a planetarium and they actually have one of those, because it kind of moves around silently and the stars look amazing from them. We don't actually have one at the Northern Planetarium anymore. We had one up until about 2005. And a lot of planetariums don't use them because We've now started to use different sort of projection techniques. Um, up in the 50s, they started using slide projectors because they kind of realised they wanted sort of other visuals up in the dome if they really wanted to tell a story. So if you wanted to sort of, for example, make a panorama of a city, say a city skyline along the bottom edge of the, the dome, you could use slide projectors. They'd use banks of slide projectors and then they could sort of like, you know, go from a cityscape to a, a, a tree step or you know, something out in the country. In the 70s, they started using video projectors, but they were kind of could only use them for a little section of the dome. That changed in the mid-90s when they kind of went, wait a minute, we've got all these amazing video projectors and we've got digital projectors or video projectors, and maybe if we use a bunch of them together and we use some edge blending technology, we can create a seamless image across the dome. And it was only up in about 1995 they actually managed to do that. Um, these are the projectors. They first started off with CRTs. We had these six massive CRT projectors in our planetarium, which we pulled out in 2005, and we replaced it with two of these um, JVC 4K projectors. And we used two of those. So one covers one half of the dome, the other one is sort of at the other side of the dome, covers the other half. Um, this is just an example of, for example, a setup where they might use eight projectors and they use, you know, it covers little sections of the dome. So they can use, you know, in a, that would be very high resolution. 
done that he's been using a projectors. So once they move to digital projectors, they kind of realise you can not just have to put up the stars, you can put up anything you like, really. And it's just kind of exploded in terms of what you can do visually in that space. So if you want to do biology, you want to do oceanography, um, anything. And it's really changed the whole face of what's happening. Now, most planetariums are connected to museums and science centres, so we kind of still... Uh, the majority of content is still made for education purposes or documentary purposes. Um, but it's also now we're getting artists who are now really starting to explore this space as well. Um, and domes come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. You can get little portable ones which are only four metres across to ones which are quite massive. You can get ones which are tilted, so these two down here kind of got tilted rake seating. Or you can get ones which are perfectly level. And in those cases, the seats will recline. This happens at the Melbourne Planetarium. What I love about ours is that when you recline in the seat, it's kind of like you're no longer in a cinema. It's a completely different experience. It's a real visceral experience because you're lying back. It's a completely different position what you're used to. And the great thing is the dome kind of disappears as well when you uh, go into it. So lots of planetariums around the world. We now have more planetariums and we have IMAX screens, yet I still get questions like what's a planetarium, so I don't know. Um, this one's uh, in Montreal, I was there last year, beautiful, beautiful planetarium. This one I love, is, I've never been to, it's in Buenos Aires, but I love it because it just looks like someone's landed their spaceship in the middle of the park. It looks amazing if it's day or night. And the one down there is the Melbourne Planetarium where I work, and science works. A couple more because I think they look so funky. Uh, Valencia in Spain, Alexandria in Egypt, and this one down here is the largest planetarium in the world, in Nagoya in Japan. It seats about 30 metres across in size, so massive dome space, and it seats 350 people. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about how do we get stuff on the dome. <coughs> about four real main ways that we can get stuff onto the dome. The first one is we actually have a real-time system installed onto, in, into, our, into our planetarium. Uh, it's basically a games engine, if you like, and they can put in... Uh, well, we, within that, they have like a data set of 30,000 stars. We'll have 3D objects included in that, planets, moons, satellites. Um, you can even get volumetric models of things like the Milky Way. They can put in data sets which might be something like 400,000 asteroids to go around in the asteroid belt, and they can actually bring that up. And like this would be sort of a typical interface for using the software, where you might have planets here, and you can sort of fly up to a planet, or you can choose to orbit planets. Um, and it can also be used to drive the playback of shows that we've rendered out. So you have a completely rendered show. We might use this as an example. A couple of shows that would be on that system there. That could be played back, just the press of a button. Uh, but the most common way we get content up into the dome is use of 3D animation, computer graphics, 3D animation. Um, I would say, yeah, at least 80% of all the stuff that's actually made for Planet Terms is still done this way. I'll give you sort of some of the reasons for that. Um, and all content for a dome particularly when doing 3D animation, 3D animation, has to be rendered with a fisheye lens. So we look at this a lot. And on our monitors, it takes a while to get used to. But this is what's happening at the front of the screen. This is what's directly behind the audience. This is over the left, and that's over the right. Yeah, it takes a while to get used to sort of like looking at these. But you know, we, I call, sometimes call them dinner plates that we're looking at. <coughs> Um, most soft 3D software available kind of can be used. Maya, 3D Studio Max, Lightline, Blender View. Um, this is from a show we did five years ago called Tilt, which Christina worked on and was one of our animators on. Um, I was up, actually, not seen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the shows that was like uh, pitch to upper primary. Um, and then within our production pipeline, we'll also use all the typical sort of Tools such as the Adobe Production Suite, After Effects, uh, which I'm not 
use composites as well in terms of compositing all the elements together. Okay, so I'll just sort of show you quickly if I can get this to play the trailer from Tilt. And we may not hear it, but we'll see. Tilt's a 25 minute show, it took us about two years to make, and it's literally Christina, Brendan, our other animator, and myself did all the visuals for it over that period of time. Um, there's a massive undertaking in terms of uh, Melbourne Planetarium as a studio because we'd never done character, lip sync characters on screen before, but we kind of really wanted to give it a shot, so um, we were happy with the result. Yeah. Um, you'll notice that trailer is actually in a standard 16 9 format. Actually, kind of re-rendered all those sequences just to make a trailer for it. Okay, <coughs> going back to having get content on there. Uh, the way that we quite often will do it is might be using time lapse photography. And in our last couple of shows, we've been working with a guy called Alex Cherney, who's an astrophotographer, specialises in doing astrophotography, and does some beautiful sequences. And it's what it's really nice sometimes when you can actually include these sequences because putting real stars up there. On the dome, people kind of inherently kind of will see that and know that it's a real sequence rather than sort of something that's CG. And sometimes that makes a stronger, more powerful connection to the audience. Um, I've got one little sequence here that he did for the show. Now, this is actually from our show, uh, which our latest show, which is called Catching the Cosmos. We did this show as a co production with a group called Castro. And one of their requirements was they said, well, we want a flat screen version. We want a 16-9 version as well as a full dome version. First time we had to do it, massive pain in the bum because it just kind of like added months and months of work to it. Um, but we used some beautiful sequences uh, by Alex. This one doesn't have audio. This is a telescope out in Western Australia called the Murchison Widefield Array. Or it's also called the MWA. So it's a radio telescope and it just uses banks of these, hundreds of these things scattered all over the place to cover a really broad area to capture uh, radio waves from space. And so they'll use those data sets to create imagery from that as well. But you know, really nice sequence where you get little satellites whizzing by um, and in full dome they work really, really well. So he actually adapted his skills to kind of like suddenly work out how can I go out and shoot this in full dome. Okay, and the fourth way we can try and get content in the dome, which is, you know, go out and shoot something in live action. But this has actually been always a bit of a, almost like the holy grail for a full dome. It's just never been that easy to go and get a camera off the shelf and get the lens and put it together and go and film it. Because the cameras aren't, we haven't been that available. The lenses haven't been available. You need fisheye lenses. They need to be on really high resolution cameras. Um, we standardly make our images, you know, and then they just look around like this. That would be 4096 by 4096 pixels. Very high resolution. But even if you take what's, say, a red 4K camera, which is equivalent to what this does, it'll be like 4K across this way. But it's really only 2K that way. So 
It's weird that we're only using this portion of it, but we only end up with a 2K image. So what we really need is something like an 8K camera, and Reddit's now just kind of released them. So this technology is only just kind of getting there, where we're going to get the sort of people who can get to go out and shoot this stuff. Um, this guy is from a film that was released last year, which is called Space School, and it's the first time a company has shot an entire planetarium film in live action. So they used a scarlet, uh, the red scarlet camera, which is a 6K camera, but still, again, yeah, only gives them 3K master, so they have to upgrade everything. But, you know, they're claiming it's the first completely live action film uh, done for a planetarium. So that brings in, it's interesting now, like, um, you know, I've been, you know, VR has been very, very big in the last couple of years, big resurgence of it with the Oculus Rift. What also has been coming really interesting, as far as I'm concerned out of that, is so many more people are now looking at, well, actually, how can we get the content for this sort of stuff? And there's just been this vast array of cameras that have come out. I mean, I've got six there, but I can probably find 30 or 40 or more cameras that are now coming out recently, and some of them are, you know, cheap as chips that you can sort of like 3D print yourself, or you can go and buy the uh, Nokia OZ camera, which is like 60,000 US, if you want. Uh, once you start using these cameras, you run into other issues, though, because you've got multiple images that you've got to stitch together, and sometimes that can work really well, and sometimes you start to have all sorts of issues. And anyone who's actually done that will kind of like start to kind of know that they can make a lot of work in terms of stitching those, all those images together. <coughs> so, just a little bit about our, our process. So, all our shows are produced as image sequences where the images are 4096 by 4096. Um, we take those image sequences and we put them into this digital sky slicer, which then looks at the image and breaks it up into eight, and it warps each of those eight little sections for a section of the dome, and it'll make another image sequence, and bumps those image sequences out, and then we take those image sequences and we make an MPEG stream. So in terms of like actually the operating sort of system behind it, we have what we call a digital sky master, which is kind of controlling these eight slaves, all of the content gets loaded onto the eight slaves. <coughs> and just for example we have we have four of each of these will be, each of these sections of the MPEGs are basically rendered out as well, HD res, so they're nineteen twenty by ten eighty. Um, and the, the the projector then takes those four streams and puts them together to make one four K stream. Now, hopefully in the future we can still like have this going into one computer and going into one projector, but at the time they installed our system in 2013, it's the only way they could do it. The graphics cards just weren't good enough at the time. <coughs> yeah. So, just wanted to talk, I said I was talking about full dome production and talk about some of the design challenges that we actually had in this, particularly when I'm bringing in new animators to work on a show. Um, one of the big problems is just getting people to perceive this space. It's this is incredibly immersive space, and it's not just a curved screen. And so many people just come in and go, oh, yeah, but when we curve it or we wrap it, and you're going, it's not a screen. The screen's going to disappear. What happens is the screen kind of looks more like this. It just disappears. When you're in there and the lights go black, you don't know how far you are away from that screen. In a regular cinema, you always know, oh, the screen's down there. In a dome, well, part of the screen's that far away, but the other part is a long way away. So you really lose your perception of where the screen is. So, you know, we need the animators to come in and sort of think not so much about what they get, where they're going to put something on the screen, they're just going to think about where they're going to position the audience in this sequence. And it frees them up immensely. So it can be a subtle shift, but a lot can make a big difference. Um, next design challenge, is, I, I always love this one, is well, how do you show the ground? I mean, typically we're trying to try and, you know, we, we always sort of plan we're going to use a 180 degree fisheye lens because that matches the dome. Well, you know, as soon as you put a 180 degree lens on something and point it in the same way that the dome's tilted, well, you can't see the ground because it doesn't matter how far away you go, you just lose your ground plane altogether. 
So the, the easiest solution, well, you can tip the camera. You can tilt the camera up and see the ground there. But sometimes that creates all sorts of different effects for people. Some people find, well, you know, I, I feel like I'm falling up or I'm falling down. I feel a bit disoriented, whatever. I mean, and we will do this, but, you know, a better way actually can often be to just use a much, much wider lens. So actually, in some settings, we'll use something like a 230 degree fisheye lens. And we've done a lot of work in the past 10 years where we've realised that we can use lens ranging from about 150 degrees to about 230 degrees. And once you go beyond that or below that, it starts to feel really weird. Like, you know, if you go beyond it, it suddenly feels like everything's towering in over you. Um, when we did one show called Our Living Climate, we had a sequence where we wanted to do some live action filming. We didn't really have a choice. Um, they were going out to film this. They only had a 180 degree lens. We absolutely needed to see the ground plane. We were filming the Stromata lights, which are these lovely little uh, fossilised sort of things that are in the water. And so we went out and they had to tilt the camera. The, the interesting sort of thing from that is works really well in a tilted dome when you tilt the camera like that. People don't even notice it. But sometimes when you have it in our dome, I find that the horizon starts to look like this. It looks like you're looking at this curved horizon and it looks a bit weird. Unfortunately, with sort of something like this, we don't have a choice. We have to live with it. And like, people accept it, but I know it's not quite as natural as it would be. And if I could go out and film it with a much wider lens, I'd, I'd love to. Okay, the third design challenge we have in our dome is crossed out. So we're putting projectors and we're pointing light into a parabola. And of course, well, yeah, you want the light that comes back down to the audience, but you've also got the light that's going everywhere. So the light scatters right, you get indirect light scattering all across the dome and it washes out the image. Now, I don't know if this next slide's going to work particularly well. I don't know such a So our animators will be working on, on their scene and it's bright. This is one of our shows called Tycho to the Moon, about this little dog who goes to the moon. Um, and it looks amazing if you don't. You think, yeah, that looks great. The colours are rich. The contrast is great. And you run into the dome and it ends up looking like this washed out murk. And it can be quite disheartening. Well, yeah. We, we, we work around it. Yeah, we, we do a lot of things. We will just increase colour saturation. We'll increase the contrast. We, we try and be careful with how we do our composition. You don't want to end up with sort of something where you might have, you know, something really bright over here and you're looking over here and the whole half of it's dark and you're kind of going, well, why is it all washed out? Well, because you've got this really bright thing behind you. So you need to be careful with how you composite stuff. So the kind of sort of main design issues that we've, we've had in, in our full dome production. So just to sum up, uh, Melbourne Planetarium Productions, we've been, well, Melbourne Planetarium's actually been producing shows since the 80s, um, but we've only done fully rendered shows since 2005 when we upgraded to a digital system. Uh, we're the only production house in the entire Southern Hemisphere that's continually producing shows. Um, yeah, our first show, Problem with Pluto, came out in 2005, and we wrote, what's great is we could put that onto a hard drive and then suddenly send it off to other planetariums, and they could just make their MP sequences for their, for their setup. Fine. First time we could do that. So we now sort of have our shows distributed worldwide. We've got them into more than about 60 different planetariums. And yeah, we've won numerous awards for them. And our latest one we just finished uh, in the middle of this year is Capturing the Cosmos. And I thought I'd show you the trailer for that one as just a way of finishing off. Uh, the other thing is it's not a finished trailer. The sound hasn't been mixed properly. Uh, but you'll, you'll get a good sense of what the show's about. And it's more to show that we do other shows besides kids' shows as well. <laughs> Oop, that's not right. No, do that. We inhabit a tiny part of a vast universe. A universe that is spectacular and puzzling. A universe that we strive to understand. A story.
Astronomers are working to solve the age-old questions of the universe. They're exploring the universe on a grand scale. It's called all-sky astronomy, and it's being pioneered under the breathtaking skies of the Australian outback. Advanced telescopes are now searching the sky in a way never before possible. They will find new things, some expected, some unknown. New discoveries will be made that could change everything. All sky astronomy is leading us towards discovering the true nature of the cosmos. Questions or? Yes. Uh, do we yeah. have to deal with resolution changes in the sphere? Because it's not a flat surface, and as far as I understand, the projectors are pretty much tuned to. Because that is further away from the projector than the center, but now you have a dome. So are the pixels growing and shrinking? Well, you, you would. You, what you would find is, particularly on what we call the spring line, which is the horizon line, your, your pixels get bigger. Mm. We don't adjust anything. For that we just kind of accept that that's kind of the area that's going to be have the lowest resolution in the overall image if you like. So there's no special lens before the projector you use. It's just the, the factory set projector. And the uh, sort of, of fact, they actually machine these lenses individually. And they're kind of like they kind of go out and have all the lenses spec designed built to their specification, and all the content, as I said. Uh, it splits it up into eight chunks for a different section, but it also warps it. So it's warped according to what that section would look like on that part of the dome. And, and how does storytelling change if you have a 360-degree uh, dome? Because I've seen uh, nice movies done by Google where they, where they try to use the cardboard and you can move your head. Yep. And, and it's a complete a different way of storytelling because you don't have a restricted area, but anything can happen behind you and next to you. So how do you deal with too much information or little to none information on one side of the dome? Or how do you yes, see it, the story? <coughs> yeah, it's really interesting. I saw some talks earlier this year on you know, um, composition you know, um, for, in the dome. Because it's, 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 it's you know, how do you, you know, position things and... And how do you get the audience to look where you want? And there's lots of different, te but, you know, lots of different techniques. Um, but you don't always want to be controlling where the audience is looked. You want to actually create sequences in the show where you're giving people a chance to go and look around. So you'll actually specifically go, to go well, this is a good spot where we want people to really explore the environment and we'll give them the space to come off and do that. But then in other sections, you really want to guide where they're looking. You can do that sometimes through camera movement. The direction that the camera is actually moving will kind of guide them. You can also do it through, you know, um, colour and contrast. There's lots of different techniques we can kind of like. Go, well, we this is the part of the story we really think people should be focusing on. Mm. So uh, we, you know, we've done techniques where um, you just even just almost black out the rest of the dome and just kind of like spotlight this particular area. Kind of like, well, that's going to be leading us into the next section. So it's actually the same thing you do with, with, the, with the games that are developed for cardboard, for example, where you try to focus the, the player's view to a certain point with colour or highlight or... Yeah. 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 That's interesting. And have you, have you uh, experienced, or did, did you try out uh, the stereoscopic 3D? There are plenty of stereoscopic domes around the world. Um, okay. I can... Yeah, I don't like stereoscopic 3D <laughs> so much. I think it's great. I don't like it in movies, um, yeah, and, I, I, and I have this entire argument constantly with the rest of the planetarium community. Um, one, one of the things for me particularly, as soon as you put on glasses, you're narrowing that view. So then, you know, you're looking around like this. Whereas if you're actually in a dome, you just look around with your eyes. You don't actually need to move your head, you know? But, yeah, well, you move, you move it like this, apart from like this when you're wearing Google glasses and things like that. It's, 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 it's quite different. 
But uh, um, I mean, in terms of depth perception, I've always argued that a dome, a really film, something filmed in a dome really well, will feel more 3D than quite often. Than, and I've actually had people come in and go, that was the most amazing 3D I've ever seen. And they haven't watched 3D. <laughs> yeah. It's like amazing because when you have sort of something where it's just black and you're just looking at stars and it goes black, you can't tell when the screen's gone. You know, it just feels like it's just going off forever. Um, yeah, and so when you put on glasses, you're knocking out your peripheral vision, you're lowering your contrast, you're lowering your colour saturation, you're actually taking away a lot of your depth cues that you would normally have. So, yeah, for me, I've never been a big fan of stereoscopic dome stuff. That said, people were pushing it really hard five years ago, as much as I think 3D cinema was getting pushed. And people don't seem to be pushing it quite as hard these days. I think, you know, 3D stereoscopic has got its full place in terms of, particularly, like, if you've got a scientific model, you can't possibly understand without seeing it, like, in 3D. I think that's great. You know, I can sort of see it still has a good place in museums and, and research and all that sort of thing. But in terms of, you know, entertainment, I'm, yeah, I don't like it at all. <laughs> yeah? Um, did you work with Jeffrey Rush to do the uh, I... Didn't, well, I mean, my tenure, our astronomer worked with Jeffrey um, for Capturing the Cosmos. We also did a show called Black Holes. Back in 2007, he worked on that one as well. Um, yeah, but I didn't get to work with him at that stage. Yeah. Yeah, one last question was um, just integrating sound, surround sound, and I'm wondering if you full day, or planet during day, like, what sound system do you have? Well, yeah, we well, have experience. a 7.1 sound system there. We used to have a 5.1 sound system. Um, we, we, I actually, we recently upgraded to a 7.1 sound, sound system um, with you know, four speakers for, as the subs. Uh, normally we work with a sound designer who comes in with us and he will actually mix in the dome because it's a really tricky space. It must to, be nice because acoustically it would be terrible. Yeah, yeah, and like there's issues like you know, um, you know, our speakers are currently very, very directional. Like, don't like how directional they are in some respects. And so, whenever we have like a narrator like Jeffrey, he can only be the centre speaker because if we start putting him to the other speakers, you kind of like get a delay in them, and it kind of causes reverb in his voice, and it changes the quality of his voice. So yeah, there's a whole variety of issues. Yeah. And I mean, we, the, the dome that we have, it's a 16 metre dome, it's actually perforated. And the reason it's perforated is to allow the, some of the sound to kind of get out. You, if you go into a dome that's completely sealed and you, there are fiberglass ones, you can whisper and you know, the person at the other side can hear you absolutely perfectly across there because of just the way the sound yeah. um, goes through, you know, bounces across a parabola. All of the movie that you show us that uh, your team develop or other team develop, do you think uh, one day we'll be able to access those uh, for people who have virtual reality equipment in their house? Like, uh, not at this stage. We have plans to develop them for that. Um, there are companies that are doing that. There's a company in Britain called, well, there's, in Britain there's a, a space centre, called what's called the National Space Centre there, and they, they have a development of, a studio there called NSC Creative, and those guys there are really embracing VR, and they're now producing their content both for they produce their content for stereoscopic, you know, stereoscopic three D, but they're also really embracing um, VR as well. So they're really interested in sort of like doing what they can do with that as well. So they the, the, the could be, and you know, I can't say like you can imagine in a future production, someone will turn around and say, "Well, we want to do this." Full 360, so we can sort of like and do it in the left eye, right eye, so we can put it in the dome. Yeah, the overhead in terms of producing that would be enormous for us. I imagine like doing a flat screen added about 30% more work for us when we did the cast, uh, capturing the cosmos. And you know, there's, there's questions of whether we should go, what's the next step? Do we go to 8K? Some people were trying to produce shows in 8K, and it's a night. To produce those. There was one studio in Beijing kind of has an 8K. There are plenty of films that have 8K projection systems. Beijing installed an 8K projection system in about six years ago. They made their first show in 8K and then immediately went back to 4K because their audience couldn't tell the difference. Um, 
it's a question of whether you do stereo, question of whether you go, most shows are currently done at 30 frames per second, some people are starting to produce shows at 60 frames per second, because particularly something that's moving across a dome, because it can move across a really quick, fast area that's close to a person, it will get to smear or shudder and it doesn't look so good, but at 60 frames it looks a lot better. But then you're kind of doubling all your rendering time and you kind of sort of start to be sort of sitting there going, well, oh, yeah. Which of these ones do we want to sort of like tackle next? Because everything could like double, you know, the amount of data you've got to have. I mean, typically our shows are about ten terabytes in terms of the, you know, everything we have in terms of production, um, and then we package them down. And they come down to like you know, you typically sort of half a terabyte of sort of space that you can shove onto a hard drive. So you literally ship hard drive when you actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. When we're sending shows around, we just go. There's a hard drive, and I just I post it to them. And they, because every every planetary, and particularly any planetary that has multiple jet projectors, those projectors are going to be in slightly different positions, and so it has to be the M peaks has to be created specifically for that site. Is there, is there a lot of manual uh, process that needs to be involved if you ship your video to another planetarium? Do they need to really do some work? Well, they just they we what we send is we would normally send them uh, an image sequence, so it'd just be like fifty thousand frames and the audio. And then they will put that into, like, we use what's called the digital sky slicer. They might have a different system, but, like, they would just put that into a process, and that takes overnight. I mean, and what was interesting up until about five years ago, that process used to take about three or four days to slice a half hour show. So it would take us, like, we'd have the show finished, we want to see, so it takes four days to make the end peaks, and you would put them up, and you go, there's a spelling error in that. Well, we can't edit these in peaks, so we're going to have to slice the whole thing again. And I had dropped frames and stuff like that. It was one show I did. We sliced it eight times before it was finished. Yeah, and the thing is, it's coming. It's like you're right doing it right at the end of the production. Okay, we're show, opening the show in two weeks, and uh, every time you're going back, oh, I'm going to take another four days. Oh, but yeah, it's just kind of part. now it's only overnight, so that's been that's been an improvement. If there's any more questions, can put our hands together for Sarah and...